Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joshua Stewart. Uh, I work for the UVA clubs program uh, here at UVA. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to a fantastic uh, lecture slash event uh, this afternoon, um, which will be given by Dr. Jennifer Shu. Um, however, I just want to go over some general uh, Zoom uh, rules, house rules. Um, feel free to ask any questions you may have um, during uh, the talk. And at the conclusion, we'll try and get to them um, during our Q&A session. Um, and if you use a chat function, those questions will come directly to me. Uh, and I will get them over, uh, hopefully, to Dr. Shu uh, at the conclusion of her talk. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Melvina Queen, who is one of the co-presidents for the UVA Club of Badwater. Melvina. Wahoo wah, good afternoon. Thank you, Josh. Um, as Josh mentioned, I'm Melvina Queen. Um, I graduated from the college in 2008, and I'm one of the co-presidents for the UVA Club of Tidewater. My co-president, Melissa Love Gilliam, I think is on uh, with us this afternoon as well, so please say hi to her if you can. Um, so despite some of the restrictions on gatherings that we've had uh, during this time, the UVA Club of Tidewater, along with the UVA club system at large, um, has been able to connect our alumni through different virtual events. Um, so we've been able to partner with local businesses. Uh, we did a virtual wine tasting um, and beer tasting, um, as well as cupcake decorating that we received kits from a local bakery in the area. Um, this past week, we actually hosted a new student meetup that allowed our students to connect, ask questions, um, and go face-to-face -face virtually uh, with other students and first years um, and transfers that will be starting their year. Um, so our next couple events, we're actually focusing on children as well as today. Um, so please look out for a cookie decorating event on Sunday, August 30th at 2 p.m. Um, we'll be joining the owner of Cookies, Cakes, and More, um, with that's a local Tidewater business in the area. Um, and we're going to do a back to school virtual reading event that's going to feature Harold and the Purple Crayon and that will be on Thursday, September 3rd um, from 7pm to 7.30. So if you're interested in joining any of our future activities, please check out the UVA clubs page as well as the UVA Club of Tidewater uh, Facebook page. And I think Josh is sending out those links, yes, in the chat box for everybody. So check out those links to stay connected with us. And I'm going to turn it over to one of our board members, Lori Overholt. She's been instrumental in and setting up this event for us today. So thank you, Lori. Thank you, Melvina. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Jennifer Shu. I've known Jen since the 10th grade. Um, when we were seniors in high school, she was voted most intelligent in our class. And I think she has proven that through the years. <laughs> uh, we graduated from UVA together. She then went on to the Medical College of Virginia and did her pediatric residency at the University of California in San Francisco. She's co-author of two award-winning parenting books, Heading Home with Your Newborn, From Birth to Reality, and Food Fights, as well as editor of the American Academy of Pediatrics book, Baby and Child Health, and the AAP's parenting website. She's often called on as medical expert for CNN, WebMD, Parents Magazine, and her recent appearance on the Today Show that discussed how to keep your kids active and engaged during COVID is available on our Facebook page, the UVA Club of Tidewater Facebook page. So today she's going to go deeper into COVID and kids. So I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Shu. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you all for taking time out of your day to join me and uh, UVA Club of Tidewater today. I'm going to be talking about COVID-19, especially as it relates to children. As Lori mentioned, I am a pediatrician, but UVA is where it all started. Um, and this is a room where it happened. Um, I'm going to try to change this to laser pointer. Um, what, one of the things I was really involved with at UVA was WUVA, which used to be a top 40 radio station. Um, I also did breakfast with the Beatles. But combining media and volunteering at Madison House really made sense when I also became a pediatrician who does a lot of work in front of the media. And the great thing about media is you can reach so many more people than you can just face-to-face one-on-one. And so this was like a perfect combination for me, um, in addition here to APO, which was a ser service fraternity I was in. But um, 
this whole combination of interest has gotten me where I am today. And I'm really appreciative of UVA for helping me get there. Um, the one good thing about being a DJ in that time was that we were literally in a room talking to a wall, no camera or nothing. So um, it's very similar to Zoom. At least I get to see myself and my slides, but I I've had a lot of practice for this. So that's kind of where um, this started. Um, I'm a procrastinator, and so about 11 o'clock last night, I was thinking, oh man, this is due today. I don't have all my slides. And I still don't have all my slides, but I'm very close. So hopefully this will cover everything you need to know. And what we're gonna talk about today is mostly starting with the medical stuff, some activity things, and then answer your questions. I really um, am glad for those of you who submitted questions in advance because that did help me include some of those responses in my slide and my talk for today. So we'll start about, um, we'll start by talking about what coronavirus is and what this new coronavirus is. There are other coronaviruses that are known to humans. These four are the common cold viruses that can cause colds, mostly in kids, but people who are around kids. And then more recently, we've had these three coronavirus strains that evolved from animals um, and now infect humans. So our current virus is called 2019 NCOV or novel coronavirus, also called SARS-CoV-2. And you might've heard about COVID-19. And the difference between that and these two is that these are the names of the virus and this is the name of the illness that it causes. So this would be like HIV or hum human immunodeficiency virus, and this would be AIDS. So it, you might hear them interchangeably, but that's what the difference is. It's a virus versus a condition. Um, and what we know is that um, these have been around for a long time, but because SARS-CoV is so new to us, nobody has had immunity to it. And that's why so many people are getting sick. Um, the other thing is because it's new to us, we don't know how it behaves and how it affects people. And what we're finding is people, the public can sometimes see this as confusing and getting mixed messages or thinking that scientists don't know what they're talking about. And it's mostly that scientists know what they're talking about based on the best information we have at a given time. So starting in 1936, Pluto was thought to be the ninth planet, but many, many years later, 2006, scientists decided that the more they knew about it, um, even though it had its own orbit around the sun, it couldn't clear its path of other objects. So it couldn't clear other objects out of its orbit path. And so that's how it got changed into a dwarf planet classification. So whereas many of us learn that there are nine planets, people nowadays know that there are only eight. And so I think you're gonna find the same thing about coronavirus. What we know now about coronavirus is gonna change 20, 30, 40 years from now, but even 20 days from now, or even tomorrow. So definitely um, take it with a grain of salt, what I'm saying today, because what I'm saying to, is true maybe today, and it might be outdated um, by the time we get done. One important thing to keep in mind is that kids are not just small adults. And this goes um, for everything from diet and nutrition to how they react to medicine, um, as well as what happens with coronavirus. So here are the facts. We know that kids make up 22% or about one fourth of the population of the United States, but only about 7.3% of the total number of COVID cases as of just a few weeks ago. We also know that since March, the number and rate of cases in kids has been increasing. And although um, hospitalization, hospitalization rates in kids are much lower than that in adults, we do think that they have severe to less severe illness, but we just don't know yet um, if it's going to stay that way now that kids are possibly going back to school and being exposed more, um, and whether they can transmit the virus just as well as adults. So you might have seen some recent studies that say that kids have a lot of viral load in their noses, and that's especially true of the preschool population. Even though they have a higher viral load, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can transmit the virus more. Um, we have found that teenagers are better at transmitting the virus than younger kids. And that might be because their bodies are more like adults. 
And so whether they're shedding it more, the way they sneeze or cough spreads the droplets more, we don't know. But right now um, we can say that kids still can get it. They tend to get it a little bit less or less severely. And we know they can transmit it, but we don't know yet to what extent. So in adults, we have a classic triad of symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath. And this is what the majority of adults will get if they have COVID infection. You can see that this can be really confusing when you look at other conditions. So this column has the symptoms of COVID, but they overlap with strep, they overlap with the common cold, they really overlap a lot with flu, um, a little bit with asthma and a little bit with allergies. One person asked if you have allergies, are you more at risk for COVID-19? And it appears to be you're probably not more at risk of getting it, but you might be more at risk of being confused with it. And so if you send a kid to school with allergies, they might get sent back because somebody fears that they could have coronavirus. So in general, allergies is not a risk factor. And we'll talk more about risk factors later, but um, yeah, just a lot of things that can confuse the picture. You'll find that in the under 10 to over 10 group, there are a few differences. Fever tends to be a little bit higher, runny nose higher in the younger kids. Whereas you see more of the adult type symptoms, especially loss of smell and taste in older kids. One thing we don't know is if younger kids just can't verbalize that they can't smell or taste or they don't care. Um, but so we don't know, is it true difference in loss of smell or taste or they just can't tell us. But these are just some things to, to um, consider when you look at the symptoms in adults and children or older kids and, and children. Um, the good news is that most kids will have mild or asymptomatic illness and completely get better in one or two weeks. Um, now I forgot to write it here, but uh, maybe less than 10% get hospitalized. In New York City, I think it was 4% who get hospitalized with those under age two more likely to be hospitalized. And they're about five times more likely to, to get um, hospital admission than those over age two. About a third will require admission into the ICU with six having to be on a ventilator. And that's about the same as the number of adults who need ICU, but adults tend to need a ventilator more often. So one study, large study of about 7,500 kids showed that 15% were asymptomatic, 42% mild, and then about 40% more with something more severe. It's important to know that deaths were really uncommon. So less than even 1%, way less than 1%. And you might have heard some stuff on social media saying, oh, if you have blood type A positive, you're more likely to get hospitalized or die. And that's just not true. Um, that was just one report, but other studies since then have shown that there is no association with any blood type with how severe your disease is going to be. Let's see what the next slide is. Um, Okay, and then here's another thing that just shows that kids make up about 9% of all COVID cases. And this is up until um, August 13th. And this is um, just data that the AAP got from states. However, in the past two weeks, there has been a 24% increase in cases. Um, what I don't know is whether that is just kids going to camp or school starting early or what, but that's a number that we're really gonna keep an eye on now that kids are are getting out and about a little bit more often. Um, testing positive can be as high as 18% of, um, of states. And hospitalizations, we talked here, probably under 10% overall. And very few deaths, which is very good news for us so far. Um, and here's another graphic that shows nine times lower chance of death four times lower chance of death or of hospitalization in the zero to four age group compared with the 18 to 29 year old age group. Um, let's see what's next. So risk factors for any age include all of these um, conditions which can weaken your immune system. Um, somebody asked me if type one diabetes could cause it as much as type two. Right now, we don't know yet. Um, we do know that for all age groups, that being in certain ethnic or racial um, categories, uh, you could be at higher risk. And this is what surprised me, um, obesity. So a BMI of 30 or higher, which I actually don't think is that high. So a five foot 10 inch adult 
weighing more than 210 pounds would have a BMI of 30. And so that in and of itself can be a risk factor for having more severe disease. These are the conditions that scientists are looking at now, which could be related to um, worsened disease in, um, in individuals. And that would be moderate to severe asthma for this age group that we're talking about, pregnancy, um, I think something to keep in mind, and the type one diabetes. A lot of people ask me, well, is my child's asthma severe enough to be um, a risk factor? And just take a look at how asthma is defined. With moderate or severe, meaning the symptoms have to occur daily, interfere with activities, occur at least one time a week, one time a week, and affect your lung function test. And that's something that a pediatrician or a pulmonologist can do. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about MISC. I think I don't have a slide on that. But um, MISC is something that we would kind of, all right, I lost my, I'll just talk about it here. MISC is a condition called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, and it's an inflammation of multiple different organ systems in the body. And the, what, what we normally see is problems like fever lasting for many days. You can have um, heart problems that can last for many weeks. Um, there can be bad GI issues, stomach issues, such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, bad rashes, um, and kids can even go into shock. So there have been close to 600 cases of MISC in the U.S. so far, and about 10 of those ended up being in kids who have died. Most of the kids obviously have recovered, which is great. And we also know that it's super rare, so only less than 600 in the entire country that we know of so far. What's interesting about MISC is that it doesn't happen right at the time of a COVID-19 infection. It tends to happen about two to four weeks later. And so sometimes people don't know that they've had COVID until they get diagnosed with MISC. Um, age is important. The average age tends to be around eight years old. So I mentioned babies under two years being more likely to be admitted to the hospital. But MISC is something that happens in an older age group. So um, CDC has a lot of stuff on MISC and, and you can read about that um, in the news as things get updated, but that's what I have for now. And if you have more questions, you can uh, put that in the chat box and we can talk more later. Mental health for families has been a very, very huge issue. And this is one of the reasons why the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a strong statement that whenever possible, given safe rates of virus in the community, kids should return back to school. And so some of the stats that I've heard is that anywhere from 10 to 25% of kids and families are suffering from some type of mental health issue or behavior problem during this pandemic. Um, from what I hear from my patients, they're either the same as pre-pandemic, they could be better or they could be worse. And the worst is what I was talking about, up to 25%. Um, a lot of people are the same. Um, what I'm finding is that people who tend to have mental health conditions running in their family are the ones that do worse. So um, parents might be having trouble with depression and anxiety, and then it also turns up in the children. And I've seen that as young as children three to four years old, where it can show up as sleep problems or fear of their parent leaving the house, or they'll no longer do their potty training. Um, so that is very common in kids, I would say the young ones, as well as up to maybe 12 years old, I'm mostly seeing kids um, you know, who are, are having those issues with behavior and, and coping. Um, the over 12 group, I've seen a mix. So some people are really anxious and depressed because they're no longer with their friends, but that age group um, is more likely to be able to ride their bike, walk, or drive to see their friends independently and not have to rely on a parent who's probably working to get them there. They have access to um, internet and social media where they can keep in touch with their friends through FaceTime or Snapchat or however they want to do any number of video games. And so I feel like there are there is a segment of the teenage population who's actually doing better mentally because once they are out of school and they had to stop doing a lot of their activities that um, were taking up their time, they actually had more time to themselves and became less stressed. Um, 
I put nutrition in here. It's not really a mental health issue, but for a third of families who reported um, problems with anxiety or depression or, or stress, nutrition and having access to food security was one of their major complaints. In, in a, you know, about a third of people um, reported that. On the flip side, I've seen a lot of people with poor eating habits, starting with the pandemic, and less exercise and spending a lot more time on screens. And so um, I've seen many, many kids have unhealthy weight gain compared to their, to their height growth during this period. And so that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, I wanted to, to remind people of a suicide talk line here. Um, there is a hotline, a number you can call and talk to, as well as a text that you can use um, if you are concerned that your child may be having ideas or actions related to suicide, um, wanting to harm themselves or even wanting to harm somebody else, you can call 911, you can talk to your pediatrician. I have had to start some um, teenagers on anxiety and depression medicine during this time. So um, definitely keep an eye out for that because there's no reason for kids to be suffering and, um, and hurting during this time as difficult as it may be. Um, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. I may come across as an extrovert, but I'm actually very much an introvert. And, and so um, in order to prevent coronavirus, it's important to avoid physical contact and not go into large crowds. And people like me are saying, I've been preparing for this moment my whole life. I don't know how many of you are like that, but I, I'd be perfectly happy staying home and uh, just ordering in or, or cooking on my own for, for forever. It's funny because we have not gotten um, outside food since March 13th or so, and my kids are begging me to stop cooking and get them Chipotle already. Um, but here I am, I'm, I'm perfectly, perfectly happy hunkering down. So one thing I like to do um, to mix things up a little bit is to talk a little bit about trivia. And what better trivia in an election year to talk about presidents um, and you know, especially since we were founded, UVA was founded by a very prominent president. Um, so who is on Mount Rushmore? Washington, Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Lincoln. And let's see, what's the next slide? Oh, that's it. So we have more trivia to follow, okay? So hopefully everyone got that right. Um, transmission, you'll find we talk about it's by droplets. So if somebody coughs or sneezes on you or on your hands or something that your hands touch and then get to your face, you can get the illness. And the biggest problem we see is adult to adult transmission. So um, adults at work, for example, having lunch together in a break room, and, you know, in my office, that would be a big thing. Or adults at um, a family get together, giving it to each other is huge. We do see some um, parent to child or daycare provider to child or teacher to child transmission, but it's, it's much rarer to see this child to adult transmission. So that's what we know for right now. And, and like I said, things could change once kids get back into school in larger numbers. Um, testing, basically there's two types of testing, the kind that goes in your nose or in your mouth that tells you if, you've ha if you have it now. And there's something called PCR, which is thought to be the most accurate. Antigen is pretty close, it's a lot faster. And so from a practical standpoint, you can get the antigen test within maybe 15 minutes or so. So at our office, we do drive-through antigen and um, we can call our patients back within a matter of a couple hours with the results. PCR is sent to different labs usually. And that can take anywhere, lately in my area, anywhere from one to 14 days to get, to get the result. And by 14 days, or even by five or six days, if a person hasn't heard the results, they figure they must be okay. They go out and about because they're starting to feel better, but in fact, they're actually still contagious and they get other people sick. And so that's why it's really important to stay quarantined until you get the results back and even possibly longer. The blood test is an antibody test that shows whether you most likely have had coronavirus or not. The problem with this antibody test is that the antibodies may not stay in your bloodstream for very long. We don't know whether it means that if you have the antibody, are you actually immune? And then 
remember when I talked about those four common cold virus coronaviruses in one of the first slides? Sometimes these antibody tests can, um, can interact or they can um, cross-react with those coronaviruses. And so you, it might show up that you have the antibodies to COVID-19 when it's actually an antibody to one of those four common cold viruses. And so basically the antibody test doesn't tell us much right now. It is something that people might find interesting out of curiosity. Um, and it's something good to know from a population basis so that if, for example, only 5% of people have antibodies, there's probably not any kind of large scale Im immunity in the community. But if we're starting to see you know, 50, 70, 80% people with antibodies, then we might think that there's some type of herd immunity in that population. So um, something to keep an eye on and hopefully we'll have more information on that in the future. Prevention, you hear about this all the time, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands, don't touch your face and choose activities wisely. And um, that to me means like, if you're gonna choose a sport, you probably wanna choose something like golf, which is spaced apart versus maybe wrestling when you're kind of on top of somebody and really in their face. But these are the kinds of things to keep in mind. Um, the other thing I missed on this slide, but I think it's somewhere else, is that duration of time of exposure is important. So if you're around somebody for less than 10 or 15 minutes, that's less of a risk than being around, you know, in a choir for like an hour in a closed space. So, and then here are, you can find any number of risk stratification guidelines online. I really like this one. It's from IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America. But again, these, these same little tips apply, fewer people, more distance. Better ventilation is something that I feel like we don't hear enough about. So in your own home, you could get a HEPA filter and um, I think it's called HEPA 13 um, is the filtration that gets to the micron size. So 0.3 microns, which is the size of the COVID-19 or coronavirus, novel coronavirus. So that's something that you might wanna look at. Um, when we get to schools, we'll talk a little bit about air change rates, um, MERV, I think that one's a 13 also. So um, there are many different guidelines. Personal risk factors is really important. So if you're going home to grandparents or somebody with an immune comprom immunocompromised uh, system, or if you're going home to a newborn or a pregnant woman, that might be um, something that, that makes you want to stick with lower risk exposure. Um, number of exposure. So somebody like me, and I don't even have that much, but let's say I see 30 patients a day, I'm constantly being exposed to people. And that's why um, I try to limit my exposures outside of work. And so we don't do takeout food. I don't go inside the grocery store as much as possible, things like that. So, um, so this is how you have to balance everything um, in your life and, and your exposure to the virus. And finally, it's risk tolerance. And, and people, some people have higher risk tolerance than others. Um, some people figure I'm a in a low risk group. Maybe I can push the limits a little bit. I'm a highly risk adverse person, and, and that might just be um, part of my medical training. But like for me, and thinking about things like should I get LASIK instead of having to wear glassic glasses? Well, for me, the the um, the chance that I could be the one in a million people who could go blind um, it, is not. <laughs> that does not outweigh the benefit of being able to see without my glasses when I wake up in the morning. So you have to think about what risks you can live with and that you feel comfortable with. And for me personally, I don't have a high risk tolerance. Okay, but everyone's different and that's okay. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about masks. Wear them out in public. You know, hopefully some places have them mandated or highly encouraged. Interestingly, if you're at home and you're sick, you definitely want to do that, okay? Or you need to stay in a separate bedroom or um, a separate, have a separate bedroom, separate bathroom, ideally if somebody's at home and you can um, separate the family that way. It's important not to put masks on anybody under the age of two, anybody who's having trouble breathing or who can't take the mask off without um, help from somebody else. 
okay? And so kids under age two, if you have their mask on securely, um, they're having trouble, they're overheating, they can't breathe, the mask feels wet, it's getting obstructed. They can't take, if they can't take it off themselves or verbally tell you, that could be um, risky for them. And so that's why we don't recommend them under age two. Um, it's important to cover your nose and your mouth. If you see somebody um, like this with their mask on or like this, you know, it's no sense in having your mask protect your chin because your chin's not going to give the virus to you. Um, so cover your nose and mouth, but make sure that you're still able to breathe in it and wash the mask after using it, um, ideally at least once a day. So, and here's another graphic. This mask is not protecting anybody. These are all good things. One important um, caveat about masks, and this in general is a great mask if you are doing things like um, woodwork with a lot of dust or, or um, wood particles. This thing allows you to blow, um, to blow things out. So if you get some, some dust in here, you're still gonna be able to blow it out. The problem is if you have coronavirus in your body and you expel that, you're still going to expose everyone around you. And so you'll find that um, a lot of doctor's offices or um, businesses will say this kind of mask is not allowed or if you have it, you need to cover it with tape or you cover it with a cloth mask or a surgical mask. Okay, so this is more for industrial purposes and these can actually protect other people and protect you somewhat as well. Okay, and so yeah, this is a sign that I was telling you. And the whole concept is your mask protects me, my mask protects you. So mutual masking can really cut down on transmission of the virus. So I hear parents say, well, my kid's never gonna wear a mask. They're four years old, they go to preschool, they won't wear a mask. They're six years old, they go to first grade, they're not gonna wear a mask. So what can you do? The first thing is that the parent needs to be a good role model and be positive about it. So of course, if you say, oh, there's no way my kid's gonna wear a mask, they're not gonna wear a mask because you've already told them that they're not gonna do it. Um, so if you're very positive about it and say, oh, I bet you could be a great mask wearer and look, you could look like like, um, I don't know, who wears a mask? Darth Vader, Spider-Man? Um, you could be dressed up and be like your favorite whatever hero or, you know, villain wears a mask. Um, I like to have patients put a, a face covering or mask on their favorite doll or stuffed animal. Let them choose or decorate their own mask. Show them pictures of kids in masks. Draw one on their favorite book character. Um, practice at home. So let's say you're starting school September 1st. Well, you don't want to try the mask on on August 31st. You need to find masks that, that fit, that are comfortable. Um, the best mask is one that you or your child will wear. So it could be the best mask for, you know, what I think is the best mask is not going to be the best mask for everybody else. I've bought at least 40 cloth masks for myself. I hate them all. Half of them fit my nine-year-old, go figure. I must have a big face. I don't know, but I'm still looking for the unicorn of a cloth mask that fits me. Um, in the meantime, there is still decent access to surgical masks, but N95s are super hard to find. Um, and so a lot of those have been reserved for healthcare workers. Um, the government is, is stockpiling some, but Amazon Business has a healthcare worker section where people can get access to things like um, N95 and surgical masks, surgical gloves, hand sanitizers, um, wipes, table wipes, like disinfectant wipes are still hard to find for, for a lot of people. But um, surgical masks, I feel like, and not even surgical, they look like this, but they're considered procedural masks because they look like a surgical mask, but may not be as as um, protected, but these can be found um, by general consumers. And I do find that these fit most people well. Um, a lot of times they'll have a nose bridge here and the elastic tends to be very comfortable. So what I tell some kids is, okay, do you play video games? Do you watch your iPad? Are you on your mom's phone or whatever? Then you need to be wearing your mask here in that time. Okay, and so if you can't wear your mask and you're probably not healthy enough to use that iPad. Um, so just, I think if you can link it with something that they're going to be doing anyway, the beauty of this is that their iPad is going to be a distraction for them. Their reading is going to be a distraction. So if you wear your mask during story time, they're not going to think about it. They're going to be less likely to fidget with it. And they're going to be like, oh, I wore this mask for half an hour. I can do it. Um, and then once they get to school, it's so much easier. And then my favorite character, Baby Yoda. 
So Baby Yoda wears masks because this is the way. Mandalorian wears a mask too, and he never takes his off. Okay, so under age two, we don't want to wear a mask. Um, developmental disabilities, especially kids with severe sensory issues, will probably have a, a, a hard time wearing masks. If you are definitely going to be at least six to 10 feet away from somebody, you're probably not going to need them. Um, if you're exercising, it can be tough to wear a mask. So one question I get asked a lot is, what if I'm running outside with a mask on? Um, that's usually thought to not be necessary unless your state mandates it, and I know certain states do. What I usually recommend is to have a, a neck mask, a, a mask around your neck or a neck gaiter around your neck that you can pull up if you can't keep your distance as you're passing people. Okay, so if people are coming the other way you're passing them, or if you're so fast that you get to pass the slower people um, who are in front of you, then you just pull that, that neck gaiter or mask up. Face shields can be good in conjunction with a mask. So you can see how air can get in and out from under this baby's face shield, right? So it's great because it's covering this baby's eyes. So the, the um, virus can't get into a baby's eyes that way, but she still needs protection if she were older to also have a mask on. So um, if you're sending your child to school um, and you want extra protection, then maybe a mask plus a face shield is the way to go. But in general, from what we know now, face shields alone probably aren't good enough. There are some that have this little piece of cloth covering that kind of like a drape that goes under the face shield. That might be um, something to look at in the future. Clear masks for um, teachers because students need to possibly see what you're saying. Clear masks can be an option as long as they're still keeping the germ from spraying out. Um, I got to tell you that face shields um, and clear masks, anything vinyl or plastic like that can get super hot. Okay. So hand hygiene, how long does it take you to sing the Goldell song? So that's become my song of choice. It turns out I can sing it in 30 seconds. So my hands are extra clean. Um, hand washing is better than hand sanitizer if your hands are greasy or soiled. So sometimes when you're playing sports, they can get really dirty, like maybe football players or people without gloves on can get dirty hands. Hand sanitizer is just going to rub that dirt around and not be great, whereas soap and water is ideal because it will um, wash the germs and, and, um, and just get them off of your hands. Um, for kids, you want to keep hand sanitizer out of the reach because it's 60% alcohol or higher. And um, we have gotten reports of ingestions of hand sanitizer and poison control getting called and having to go to the ER. So keep it out of your, your child's reach. Um, I usually limit it to two years and up and make sure uh, they dry their hands really well afterwards so that um, all that alcohol can evaporate. Okay, so which state has produced the most presidents? So that's question one, how many presidents and who are those presidents? Okay, so Let's see, the state with the most presidents is Virginia, and Virginia has had eight presidents. The next closest state is Ohio with seven. And I can never remember this list, so I'm just going to show it to you because eight is too many to remember. Um, so Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, Zachary Taylor, Woodrow Wilson. So for extra credit, who's the only president from Georgia? Jimmy Carter from Plains. And there are actually 29 states with zero presidents. So they need to, to get moving on that. All right, to be able to catch up to Virginia. So eight presidents, many of whom we know. All right, shifting gears over to schools. So to keep in mind, virtual or not going to, you know, virtual only is the lowest risk, of course. Having small groups of kids who don't mix is the medium risk, um, and they're not sharing any like supplies or anything like that. And the highest risk is going back to the old normal, which is crowded classes, everyone is passing each other in the, in the hallways at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So things to consider would be, how's your kid going to school or the bus, bus is crowded? Is the classroom cl crowded? What are they doing about PE? Because that heavy breathing can transmit virus more, as can singing or wind instruments. Um, lunch, 
Are they spacing at lunch? Are they spacing in the hallways? Are they all going to the bathroom at the same time? Um, it's recommended that kids bring their own water and have their you know, own water bottle and maybe not use water fountains because that's a shared object. We talked about ventilation needing a little bit more um, attention. And there is a, an entity called ASHRAE, A-S-H-R-A-E, that has standards for all kinds of um, public buildings, including um, schools and colleges. And how often are they cleaning? Um, so back to school. I don't think that term means what we think it means because it could be any number of these things. Um, really keep in mind that whatever you choose now at the beginning of the school year may not be the same as how school looks at the end of the school year or even two weeks from now. So I'm in Georgia and many of our counties, not many, but some of our counties outside of Atlanta did go to school in person. Mas masking was optional and they closed within a, a matter of two weeks. So there are some high schools that have already had to close down and go virtual um, for either a few weeks or an unspecified amount of time. UNC Chapel Hill just yesterday decided to close and go all virtual. Um, so you're gonna hear a lot more stories and, um, uh, like that. So some schools are gonna close down to break that cycle, to do some cleaning. It's important to find out what your school's um, policy is for isolating kids who are found to be infected, quarantining anybody who's been um, in six feet for longer than 15 minutes, and that's usually considered even a classroom because they're in that space for so long with each other. So let's say a teacher tests positive, does the entire class have to quarantine and stay home for 14 days? So that's something that you might hear about. Will the school rec recommend testing before you come back? And with so many places having poor access to timely tests, that tends to not be the best option. So if you have easy access, then yes, testing can be helpful in getting kids back into school sooner. But if not, then you still follow the 14 days of quarantine if you've been exposed or staying home for 10 days if you're infected. Um, so this is another fun um, risk graphic and things to consider. So low risk up here, medium risk. So medium risk, being in a carpool with non-household members is higher risk than driving your, you know, in your own family, of course. Um, but then the next highest risk would be a school bus or public transportation. So these are all kinds of things to consider for school, back to school. The CDC has a sample school checklist of symptoms. Like these are things where you really don't want to be um, sending your kid to school or having your child checked out before you send to school if they have any of these symptoms. Or again, have things checked out if your child has had close contact with somebody who has COVID. If you live in a high community transmission area, that's me. If you've traveled in a high you know, area, that's me too. So like the fact that Georgia's open, we're already kind of ignoring some of this in some of the, the school districts. And then that this is where they're closing down schools in Georgia if they've had close contact with. So when somebody's testing positive, they are shutting things down. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are Hamilton fans, but when the Hamill movie came out or Ham film came out on Disney Plus, I woke up at 3 a.m. so I could see what it was all about because it was amazing and totally worth it. So I'd seen it twice live, um, but seeing it as in movie form was so fun because you can get close-ups of their faces and they really did an ex excellent job with, um, with the sound quality too. So I was, I was really impressed. So what do these things have in common? UVA, so Jefferson started it, UVA Monticello, we know that, but what does Jeff, what does does um, UVA Monticello have to do with Great Wall of China and the apocalypse in Athens? And I'll give you a second to think that over while I drink my water. So the answer is that they were all UNESCO World Heritage Sites and they were identified as such in 1987. So we got identified as a World Heritage Site at the same time as Acropolis and Great Wall of China which had been around way longer than UVA and Monticello. So I think we win. Um, let's move on to sports. So sports can be safely done if you're in a bubble. Um, the NBA currently has a bubble and it seems like that is working out for them, except for those who 
come to Atlanta and go to a strip club for the wings um, and then go back. And so the bubble can be penetrated, but that is probably the best way to keep everybody safe. Um, the bubble, unfortunately, is not practical for most kids. So the National Federation of State High School Associations put together a risk stratification of low risk sports, medium risk sports, and higher risk sports. Um, with swimming, golf, cross country, staggered starts being lower risk, and then wrestling, football. I thought it was interesting, boys lacrosse versus girls lacrosse. Boys was higher risk, and then competitive cheer and dance being higher risk. So these are some things that you might see if your child is doing sports. And this is just, just the thing for my mental health. Um, Lori, um, one of the host, mo the moderators of this, and I were supposed to go to the final four this year because it was going to be in Atlanta. And what better way to save money when you don't have to fly or get a hotel than going to the final four when it's in your own city. And then darn pandemic, darn coronavirus messed things up. So um, something maybe to look forward to, hopefully we can make it to the final four again in the future and win. CDC put out this great thing. So these are the lower risk activities you can do within any type of sport. So at home versus a team, com competing within your team, and then kind of going um, to other area, other teams in your area to the full on travel, you go to different states or regions. So, um, both of my kids are doing this right now, and I'm gonna be a little bit nervous when we move on to that, um, but those are things to keep in mind. Let's see what's next. When they're practicing, try to keep distance, especially even for spectators, if you're allowed to have fans at the sporting events, if possible, wear a mask. So um, if there's a comfortable mask you can wear, Adidas and Under Armour have some specifically for working out. Galen Rupp wore a mask because the pollen count was so high and that did not affect his performance. Um, so that might be a possibility. Even if you can't wear a mask during these sports, it's important to have a mask on hand as you're walking to and from the field. So uh, it's good to either have a mask around or we talked about having a neck gaiter around where you can just pull it up as you're walking back and forth. And then try not to share equipment. So everyone should have their own bat and ball and water bottle, et cetera. During this time, about half of patients um, canceled or delayed their checkups, as well as almost 10% delaying vaccinations. And this is really important because we know that if we stop vaccines in kids, then other illnesses will go up. And we don't want to have other illnesses in the time of COVID, especially going into cold and flu season. So one of the worst things that could happen would be kids are, you know, in person going to school. If they're not vaccinated for things like measles or flu, they could get sick with those. And then if you get COVID on top of that, that could make their um, illness more severe. So we've talked about kids in general having less severe illness, but if you have something else that could have been possibly prevented on top of it, it could be more severe. Um, vaccines, this is just a reminder for me to talk about the fact that COVID vaccines um, are in the works. I think that there are very few in kids, especially in this country, we don't have any yet because we want to test them in adults first to make sure they're safe and effective. I believe there are some in other countries, um, but this is another thing to keep your eye out on for the future because if we're not getting enough community immunity just from natural infections, vaccines may be something to help protect people. If you're doing a virtual visit um, with your pediatrician, which I'm doing maybe two thirds in-person checkups now, and then the rest may be virtual visits with a very small handful of sick patients in my office, try to have your child's vital signs um, available pharmacy information and wet medicines and check out your equipment beforehand. Um, we've had people do, mostly people do these from home, but we've had them do it in their cars. Um, and usually people are, are pretty appropriate, although I've, I have seen and heard of pictures of people who were not fully clothed and um, just sit down otherwise. So what did I miss? I'm sh I know I've talked fast. We went through a lot of slides today. A lot of you had some great questions, which I did try to cover. Um, in these slides, and I believe Lori has been taking your chat questions and will throw a few out to me right now. Um, so let's go for it. 
Okay. Wow, Jen, that was great. I mean, that was a lot of information. <laughs> I don't even have kids, and I'm like, oh, that was interesting. <laughs> Good. Um, there was a question thrown out in the chat from Stephanie Augusta. She wanted to know what is the age range of child? 30 states count 0 to 19, 15 count 0 to 17, and three states include up to 20 years old. Where's the line between uh, prepubescent and pubescent body? That's a, that's a great question. And then that can differ a lot for a lot of kids. So there can be some kids who look like they're full on in puberty at 11 or 13 and others who haven't started puberty by like 16 or 17. So unfortunately, we don't have that broken down into exact ages and things. But as I mentioned earlier, um, kids who look like adults who look like adults are probably going to behave like adults in their um, in the ways that they get sick with COVID or transmit COVID. So yeah, for some reason, there's not a, a uniform way of reporting in the states. Um, and maybe as we get more data, hopefully somebody will kind of put that together. She also wanted to know if there's any data on vaping having impacts on lungs. Oh, thank you for asking that. I meant to, I meant to mention that. So yes, yeah, so anything that can affect your lungs, such as vaping or smoking marijuana, could potentially put you at higher risk of, of um, severe or more severe complications of COVID. So what we see in COVID, even in some asymptomatic people, is changes on either x-ray or CT scans of the chest and of the lungs. And so there can be damage even if you're asymptomatic. And anything that is potentially um, damaging to the lungs, such as va vaping or marijuana or anything like that, could possibly make things worse. I just don't think we have enough you know, hard data showing how bad that could be. But it's, I think it's another incentive to, to try to convince kids not to start vaping or, you know, smoking other things or to stop if they've already started. Okay. Um, Melissa Reese asks, are Nick Gator still good? I have seen something recently. Where yeah. <laughs> so that's a good question. There was one study from Duke that looked at maybe 14 different types of masks and it had one person talking through it, and I forget the phrase that they said. And they looked at the droplets and the particles that came through that mask and how it spread. And that particular study showed that the particles that came out of a fleece net gaiter was worse than having no face covering at all. That, um, that unfortunately, it was just one study, but it did get a lot of press. And what people took from it was that net gaiters are not good at all, but from other studies and other ways of testing the effectiveness, effectiveness of, of uh, face coverings, um, it shows that anything is probably better than nothing. And so I wouldn't throw out the neck gaiters yet. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there's probably a place for them, such as if you're exercising and passing by people or going to and from fields, things like that. And if it's the only thing that your child will wear, um, that might be the, the way to kind of train them to go from a neck gaiter to a, a mask that might be more protective. So I think the jury's still out, but I don't think it's as bad as that one study showed. Okay. Um, Katie Sexton, Sexton asks, why are you avoiding takeout food and should we all be? Oh, no, no, no. So I'm avoiding takeout food because I'm crazy and that's why I don't get LASIK for my eyes. Um, <laughs> and I also wipe down all my groceries, even though everyone says you don't have to. So I, um, it's, I'm kind of like an all or nothing person. So before pandemic, I only did take out food. I only ate out. I never cooked. And so when the pandemic started, I was paranoid. And because I knew I was going to get exposed at my work, um, I shut everything else down because I wanted to be able to control what I could because if I were to get sick, then I can say I've done everything possible in my power to avoid getting coronavirus or spreading it to my family. So no, that is just my own idiosyncrasy and my paranoia and I don't recommend that to anybody. And I, I think I'm gonna have to start soon but just by the fact that, like I said, my, my kids don't like my cooking. Okay, but from a, from a medical standpoint, I think that's overkill. As is wiping your your um, wiping groceries groceries like I do, but you do you. I'm doing me, and I'm crazy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Paul Hutchins 
um, is asking, is there any data on infection rates on minority kids versus majority? So um, one of the things that I think I forgot to mention was that of the MISC kids, so the kids without inflammatory syndrome, 73% of them were either Hispanic or Black. And when you look across all the age groups and all the complications, they do come from um, under, underrepresented minorities. So um, some of that has to do with, you know, socioeconomic factors and the type of living situations they may be in, if they are in extended family situations, for example, but also if they are working in, um, if they have essential work type jobs where they have to leave the house and get exposed. And so, yes, we do see underrepresented minorities um, getting more sick, and there are many different reasons why. And I didn't draw on Hamilton's thing, so I don't know how that yellow got there. <laughs> um, there was one. Uh, one quick thing. It is yes. almost reaching one o'clock. Okay. Um, we are definitely going to take the last couple questions we have. So. Okay. We will go over a couple minutes late. We hope that you stay with us um, as Jen answers these questions. Um, but I just wanted to give you all that update. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll end the question asking phase just so we don't run over too much time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Maria Belling wants to know if my son had pneumonia at the age of 18 months, is he at higher risk for complications now that he's five? So that's a great question. I do hear that a lot also. In general, if your son has been fine since then and doesn't have any issues with his breathing at baseline, he probably is not at any higher risk. Again, um, that could change as we've learned more, but right now I would say no, he's not at higher risk. Okay. But also, it's a good idea to ask your pediatrician who knows your son and, and other things about your son that might kind of um, give you more information. But just in general, a, 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 somebody who had it many years ago and is fine now, I would not expect it to be at higher risk. Okay, I'll do this um, one last question. It's kind of a two, two question, but uh, Brandy Mock wants to know, for kids who return to school, what is good practice when they get home? Should they leave their shoes outside, shower immediately? And then others are asking, what can we do to protect our kids getting ready to move into dorms? Okay, great questions and, and I have, kids in both of those categories. And so, um, so it depends on what the, the rate of transmission of virus is in your area. So if you have very low risk, your child probably doesn't need to do much besides wash their hands. Um, I, I just have my child who's been going to school since yesterday, um, wash and sanit or use a baby wipe and sanitize her hands in the car. I think yesterday we went to the pool afterwards. And then she took a, sh a shower after that. So, and, and we tend to take off our shoes um, as we get into the house anyway. So I think um, looking at the transmission in your area, you could do very little or you could do a lot. So for me coming from work, and I know um, one of, somebody who's a nurse asked about this in the questions ahead of time, um, I change into different clothes at work um, and then I throw everything into the laundry as soon as I get home and hop straight into the shower before I do anything. So that would be the extreme. And then for kids moving into dorms, um, it really depends again on what's going on at that area as well as the college. And um, so I know where my son's going to be going to school um, next week, they are only having kids in single rooms. They are still sharing bathrooms. They are doing takeout mostly for the meal plan. Um, dining hall is going to be um, spread out a little bit more. They're encouraging kids to eat outside or back in their dorm rooms and things like that. So lots of hand washing, lots of hand sanitizing, masks. And in dorms, I would try to avoid large groups. You know, just try to, to stick with a few people in your little quarantine pod and, and avoid crowds. Okay. Well, it is after one o'clock and we want to respect your time and it, and also everybody else's, but there were more questions, but thank you. You'll so just have to have me back for part That's two. That's right. We <laughs> love that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for doing that. That, it, that was really very helpful and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone on the call did as well. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Wahoo wah. Wahoo wah.